Hey everybody, welcome back to The Engineered Angler. Today we're gonna to talk about how to get started with lure making. I'm gonna talk about the kind of tools you'll need just at a minimum, just to get going, the kind of materials you're gonna to have to get a hold of, and some of the skills you'll have to develop as you go along. So if you're thinking about getting into lure making, or you just wanna know how people are getting started doing it, stick around. So let's talk a little bit about what might motivate somebody to actually make a lure. Considering there's so many out there in stores and online that you can buy dirt cheap, a lot cheaper than you can make them, honestly. Your motivation might be just the satisfaction of making your own lures. And then knowing that when you catch a fish with it, it was all you. For me, since I'm a lure fisherman primarily, I almost never fish with natural baits. It was almost a necessity because I would find a lure I really liked, but it was just a little too small or just a little too big or it sank a little too quickly or it didn't have the action I wanted. And I began to think, well, you know, if, they're, if I can't find them on the shelf, maybe I need to make them. And that's how I got started. That's really my motivation. It's a lot more pragmatic than it is sort of creative impulse but it also satisfies my desire to create things and fabricate things. I have a real interest in just fabricating things. So that's why I get into it. Everyone's gonna have their own motivations. A lot of you might be artistic already and have drawing or carving skills, and those skills will lend themselves really well to this. You'll just have to learn a little bit about the design aspects, the materials you'll need to use, and some techniques that you'll have to adopt. I'm not gonna show you how to make a lure, but I'm gonna give you some guidance on how to set up your own little mini lure shop and what lure you might wanna get started with. I built this little lure shop specifically to make lures. And I know it seems a bit much just for a little hobby, but it was something I really wanted to do. But the average lure hobbyist doesn't need this much space. So first let's just talk about what kind of space you're gonna to need to actually make lures. I started off in my garage with a little two foot by three foot little piece of counter space and was able to do everything I wanted to do there. Now you gotta be clever and you gotta use whatever uh, space saving techniques you know of. My little workspace back then was rough and it was halfway disorganized, but it worked and I made a lot of nice lures in that little space in my garage. I had all my equipment, my tools and my materials. Let's talk about tools now. So you're gonna need every type of plier that you can possibly get your hands on from little traditional ones to needle nose, bent needle nose, very long and slender needle nose. All these come in really handy for manipulating wire and you're gonna be using wire as part of your internal harnesses and making twist eyes. For whatever type of lure you're gonna actually be making, you're gonna be using some sort of wire, especially if you're into spinner lures. And you're gonna want a good strong wire cutter and I really recommend a pair of these jewelers pliers. They have a stepped diameter peg end and, and an internal radius end and they work really well for bending wire. Now I've placed links in the description for everything that I use, everything that I can find a link in Amazon for. And just as a quick disclaimer, all those links are affiliate links. And what that means is that anytime you click on that link and buy that item, a small portion of that price comes to the engineered angler and helps support the channel. It doesn't cost you more, but it helps the channel out. So along with those generic hand tools, you're gonna need tools to be able to manipulate the material, whether you're using wood or some other main material that you're gonna make the body of the lure out of, you're gonna need some saws. And I really recommend this kind of straight back saw and you don't have to buy a super expensive Japanese version of this. This is from Harbor Freight. I don't think I paid more than three or $4 for it. And I've had it for years, it cuts great. And you can use this to even shape if you take your time and just cut off small pieces. But you can also get a coping saw. And if you don't know what this is, it's a very small, very narrow bladed 
saw that allows you to cut really tight radiuses. And you can cut just about any shape with this thing. And you can do it pretty accurately if you take your time. And the nice thing is, is you can get replacement blades that are meant for cutting metal as well. You're going to need some sort of drill. A cheap cordless drill like this is what I keep in here because it doesn't have a whole lot of power. I do a lot of things while I'm holding it in my hands. So I don't want a really powerful drill that'll slip and then blast through my finger. This little Harbor Freight drill I think cost me less than $30. The battery lasts me weeks and weeks. But you don't have to have a cordless or even a corded drill, especially if you're going to be working on small lures. You can get yourself a little hand drill. And this works really well with softer woods. And you just hold it in your palm and spin it with your fingers and you can drill a hole in it. It just takes a little bit of patience, but you also get the advantage of having a lot of accuracy. And generally speaking, you're not gonna slide off and mar the surface of your wood. And the kits usually come with some really tiny bits that are actually kind of difficult to get a hold of by themselves. And before you actually get to paint your lure, you've gotta sand it down. So I really recommend these sanding sponges. And I really like these sanding boards. They're 120 on one side and 240 grit on the other. Really handy and they, they actually last a long time and they're not really very expensive. I really like having this set of small files, uh, different shapes. Uh, they're all really fine grit or fine cutting and they come in really handy to refine those details that maybe you're carving in or maybe you're just trying to get some flaws out of your carve. And if you're already a handy person, someone who's already creating things, you probably have a rotary tool like this. This one is Ryobi, it's not a Dremel, but you can get any kind of knockoff. They work pretty well, especially if you're not using them really intensely. They'll last quite a bit. I've got this little pistol grip one that I really like. The batteries are going bad on it, but I'm gonna need to buy a new one. And as you get more and more into this hobby, you're gonna need bits that are a little more aggressive, a little larger. And these rasp bits come in really handy. They'll take a lot of wood off really quickly and you can use it on a drill or on a Dremel. A set of these Forstner bits is a nice handy thing to have. And if you've been watching this channel, you've watched me use this safety wire twisting pliers and these come in really handy to make twist eyes. It's what I primarily use it for. So let's talk a little bit about materials now. You're gonna need glues, you're gonna need paints, you're gonna need clear finishes for your lures. You might wanna buy lure eyes already pre-made if you wanna paint them on. But you can do all this stuff really inexpensively and very simply, and you can get a lot of this stuff from discount stores, dollar stores, that sorts of thing. So as far as glues go, you're gonna have to have a bunch of super glue laying around. I buy the least expensive stuff I can find unless I need something for a special project, something thicker or thinner. And you wanna have some quick setting two-part epoxy. And again, I don't buy the expensive stuff, mostly because I use it rarely enough that it'll go bad on me. And I'd rather get these little tiny two tenths of an ounce little containers and use them up quickly. I like to have some spray on contact cement around. And of course, any kind of general purpose glue you wanna have around or you already have around. And a kind of combination of glue and tool would be a hot glue gun. So let's talk about the material you're gonna to wanna to use to make the body of the lure. And I'm taking for granted that you wanna make hard body lures. So just starting off, I really recommend that you use balsa just for ease of use, ease of access, and the fact that it's pretty inexpensive. I like buying these quarter inch sort of thick flat stock. Uh, this one's only an inch. An inch and a half is a better size. And one of the best ways to make a balsa lure is to make it in two halves. And you can see that in many of the techniques of many lure makers, if you're watching most of the other channels, you'll see lure makers put two pieces together, shape it, pull it apart, and then put all the internal parts inside there. The reason for that is that balsa is really weak. It's easy to shape, it's easy to work with, but it doesn't have the strength to actually carry the loads of a big bite. So an internal screwed in eye, either for the hook or the tie on eye, is not that great an idea unless you're fishing for small species, panfish, that sort of thing. But what I would recommend is don't be a wood snob. Don't get too picky with the kind of wood you use, especially starting out, because exotic wood is expensive, it's hard to find, and every time you kind of goof one up, uh, you'll feel it. Use what you can find, what's inexpensive, what's around you. Even just a piece of pine can be turned into a good lure. But I'm not really addicted to using any particular kind of wood at all. In fact, I'll sometimes 
uh, vary the materials into synthetic stuff like this PVC board. And this is the kind of stuff you can buy at home improvement places. Uh, and it's designed really for outside trim. And of course, materials are up to you. I mean, you can get as creative as you want to. I've made lures out of coconut husks. In my last video, I made a lure out of a wooden ball. And before that, out of a section of a dowel. And these lures work. They really do work. They catch fish and they're fun to fish with. All right, so let's talk about finishing the lure, painting it and putting a clear coat for protection. Now I've got a kind of an elaborate setup. I've got a paint booth with a, an extractor to get the spray fumes out, some good LED lighting, but you don't have to have all this. You can have all your tools and gear all fit into a couple Tupperware boxes and you can put them in a top shelf in a closet or under a bed and make it real easy on yourself. You can, you can do all this in an apartment if you're clever. So as far as painting the patterns on your lures, you can get started with the least expensive possible option, which is some kids craft paints and an assortment of artist brushes. And then you can just get your creative juices going and hand paint the patterns and paints that you want on your lure. And I know a lot of you guys have been watching lure builds from really talented lure builders and lure painters, and you want to do the same thing. And that stuff takes practice. And I know everyone wants to jump straight into having an airbrush and it's not a bad idea, but I would first really build my skills making the lure and having a lure that works. And then you can work on the aesthetics. An ugly lure that works will catch fish. A beautiful lure that doesn't work won't catch fish. All that said, it's nice to have an airbrush. And the most expensive part of that airbrush setup is the compressor. Now, right now I'm running off of a really big shop compressor, but this little guy painted a lot of lures before I actually moved out to the shop. And this little compressor I bought at Harbor Freight, I think it was $60, but there are several links for airbrush equipment in the description for options that I would recommend for the beginner. The cost of an airbrush can range from just like $15 all the way up to five or $600 for really high end airbrushes. I personally don't feel that my limited artistic skills are going to be needing uh, the quality that a uh, three or four or $500 airbrush will bring. But you can go from a simple little kit like this master airbrush, which really does work really nicely right out of the box. And it gives you the opportunity to learn the technique of using double action airbrush, which means that the trigger on it both goes down and back. When it goes down, it releases air. And when it goes back, it begins to release paint. And it takes a little bit of practice to get those two actions to work in sync to give you what you want. You also want an airbrush that is gravity fed. And you'll note that by the fact that the cup is on top and not hanging off the bottom. The other style, the vacuum draw with the little jar hanging off the bottom. And it's not efficient at all for the kind of painting you're going to do as a lure maker because you're going to be using very little paint. You're going to be very surprised that typically this little tiny three milliliter cup is going to be plenty. Almost always I'll use three to five, maybe 10 drops of paint max. The nice thing about a kit like this is that it comes with multiple needles and multiple tips, just slightly different sizes so that you can play with it. You can experiment with the pattern it leaves and the ease of spray uh, with that particular tip. Most recently I bought an Iwata. This one was $150. This little master I paid, I think $23. The Iwata certainly gives you a higher quality spray. It gives you a nicer touch. Uh, but I think in my opinion, until you've gotten some experience working with an airbrush, the extra quality and touch you get with the Iwata is going to be kind of wasted, but that's just my opinion. All right. So the final step in creating your lure is going to be clear coating it, putting a coat of clear resin on it or clear lacquer, or even a clear enamel thick enough and shiny enough to look nice and to protect the paint. So you end up with a beautiful glassy crystal clear, shiny finish that makes your lure look really professional. Currently I'm using UV cure resin which is a little complicated because you need ultraviolet lights to get it to cure and harden. A simpler method is to use two part clear epoxy resin and you can buy either the style that's used for coating tabletops or you can use 
uh, resin that's really meant as an adhesive but set crystal clear and usually you can buy those in smaller quantities and save yourself a little money. When I'm using a two-part resin I use a product put out by East Coast Resins. I find it gives me the most predictable finish and I can pretty much be guaranteed a flawless glassy finish. Your set time is really long for two-part resins typically at least 24 hours and they really don't come completely hard for another four to five or even seven days depending on temperature so for those initial 24 hours for them to get to the point where you can actually touch them you'll have to find a way to put them somewhere in some manner that the coating won't sag off too much and they won't become covered in bugs and dust so you'll have to come up with some sort of either hanging box and you can just make that out of cardboard or you'll need a turner. Now I made a turner almost right away because I knew that my favorite part was that really bright finish. And just recently I made a lure turner that will fold up into a Tupperware box. Let me show you. And as you can see this turner fits just about anywhere. Let's assemble it and I'll show you how it works. And this is the simplest arrangement. It has a, an adjustment for length and a little pin that slides in to hold it at the length you want. And this is kind of the setup I had when I first started because it'll hold just one lure at a time. And the nice thing is I've got a little bit of a spring back here on this backstock and the motor will turn it at about five to six RPMs. And that gives me time to actually put the resin on as it's turning and then allow it to turn while it's setting and I can always take and drop a box over it to keep the dust and the bugs off. But if you graduate to multiple lures at a time, I'll show you how I set it up for that. And I have uh, tutorial videos on how to build all this stuff. Check out the playlist called Lure Making Tools and I'll put a link to it in the description too. And the nice thing about this is as you saw it breaks down into that box and you can stick it anywhere in your apartment or your house or even your dorm room. So the next step is to decide what is going to be your first lure that you make. And my recommendation is to make something that makes you want to make it. Yeah. Something you have a passion for, a lure that you like to use. Maybe you already have a lure and you just want to make a copy. And that's actually a good way to go because you can copy the shape, copy the location of the bib, and then you can weigh it on a little gram scale and copy the total weight of that lure as well. And then that way you can have a better chance to actually copy not only the look, but the action of that lure. The other option is to just make a lure that I made or some other lure maker that you like who gives you a full tutorial on how to build that lure. This way there's less guesswork and a lot less frustration when you put the thing in the water. But keep it simple. This little lure right here is super easy to make and a lot of fun to fish with and I made it out of popsicle sticks. I highly recommend that you check out my playlist that's called Lure Design Build. I'll put a link to that in the description as well. And just watch everyone you can stand to watch and I think you'll pick up a lot of information and a lot of techniques that'll help you even on your very first lure. And if you did get something out of this video give me a thumbs up. It really helps with that pesky algorithm that seems to want to ignore the channel and anything else you can do to help me grow it a little bit would be greatly appreciated. All right I'll see y'all on next Friday's video.